I've had the Canon RF 800mm lens for about a week now thanks to downtown camera. Normally focal lengths like this often cost well over $10,000, but they usually have a better focal ratio range of 5.6 instead of f11, are better built, and weigh considerably more but do give you better results. The 800mm weighs less than 3 pounds and is only 351mm long when fully extended. When not in use, it collapses to less than 300mm, which is very helpful for traveling. These days, you don't want to be traveling with what looks like a gun barrel in your backpack. But no one offers an 800mm lens. Yes, you can get the Sigma lenses that provide you with about 600mm, but not 800. And that extra 200 makes a difference. So stick around and I'll show you how. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning into The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, or tutorials. And all the links to everything I talk about in this video, including gear discussed, are placed in the description down below along with my affiliate links. So if you need camera gear and you want to help support this channel, consider using the affiliate links down below for B&H and Amazon. And if you're in Canada, give Patrick a call at Downtown Camera. Unlike the pricey R5, the 800mm is very much for the ordinary filmmaker. You'll be impressed by the shots you can take and how up close you can get while preserving detail. I played around with this lens at Harborfront just after I got it. I was close enough to this skull that it wasn't even aware of me, allowing me to capture it at 4K HQ. This mode gives us more detail for cropping in later. So when I punch in here, there's tons of detail. You really should see this on a large TV. It looks absolutely amazing. But what about space? How often have you looked up at the stars wanting a closer look, wishing you had a telescope? Well, I actually owned a telescope about 20 years ago. It allowed me to capture the moon up close, see Mars, and Jupiter along with its four moons. The 800mm allows me to get shots as good as my telescope. But I want to see more. The 800mm cropped in tops out at 1280mm. The R5, R6, or any other RF body with a 4K cropped mode coupled with the 800mm lens and a 2x extender, are you ready for this? Yields almost 2600mm. That's more than enough to do moon flyovers and get up close with the moons of Jupiter. Is your childhood curiosity sparked? Well, stick around, I've got more videos and photos to show you. But let's discuss the elephant in the room. You might be thinking of getting the 600mm lens for its size and to save a few hundred dollars. But it's like ordering a small cup of coffee or tea. It's never quite enough and you always regret not going for a larger size. 600 millimeters is enough to shoot the moon. It will allow you to see Mars and Jupiter, and you can always get the 1.4 extender to bring it up to 840 millimeters. But considering that the 800 millimeters is just $200 more than the 600, and that the 1.4 extender costs $499, I feel that the 800 millimeters is a better option. And on top of that, the extender increases the f-stop by the same factor. The 800mm combined with the R5 or R6 crop mode gives an effective 1280. That's without spending money on an extender. And every photo and video I've shown you in this, uh, in this video, or that's about to show up, was shot without an extender. If you want to get more detail on Mars or see the colors or banding of Jupiter, try popping on the 1.4 extender. And the 800mm can deliver just shy of 1800mm in crop mode. Or get the 2 times extender and you're almost at 2600 millimeters. But you need not step right from 800 to 2560 millimeters. Starting out at 2560 makes it very difficult to locate the celestial body. I recommend locking onto the subject uncropped, centering the object, and then switching to crop mode when you're ready to film or take photos. Using the crop mode in combination with these 2 times extenders can give you these focal lengths. 800 without any crop mode or extender, then 1280, 1600, uh, 1800, or 2560. But if you're like me, you'll probably want to do flyovers of the moon, and to be able to do this, you're going to need the 2 times extender. Flyovers are pretty simple to do. All you want to do is just focus on the moon and make sure it's on the left side of the frame, and basically the Earth, Earth's movement does the rest. But you'll want a solid surface, and you want to make sure the, the iPad, the tripod, is anchored to limit vibration because even the slightest vibration will make it look like the Earth's shaking. And even a gust of wind can cause shaking. So this is where using a quality tripod really helps. But let's get back down to Earth. Last Sunday, I spent the day trying to get good bird shots. 
My garden is usually filled with blue jays, cardinals, godfinches, cedar waxings, and many more. But sadly, most are gone except for these guys. Just a few weeks ago, my garden was alive with the sounds of birds, squirrels, and cicadas. You probably heard them in my Q&A videos. It was a pleasant discordant mixture of sounds, a garden symphony, if you will. But the air is mostly silent. The kind of silence you hear when an impending November storm is coming. Ducks, geese, and swans are still around enjoying the peace left behind, but others were harder to find like a snowball in hell. But the day was not a total loss. I did find a few godfinches, and these guys. Be the first to comment on what species this is, and you'll earn an extra entry into my R5 contest giveaway. These guys were about 50 feet away and pretty high up. The 600mm just wouldn't have been enough, but it's a good lens for trails, and yes, I was using crop mode. I was also fortunate enough to capture this great blue heron. These guys sometimes take off when you get within 100 feet of them. But this one, I think she liked to have her picture taken. We really did have great weather that day. One creature that took time to pose for me though was this squirrel. So long as I fed him an abundance of acorns, he stayed with me all afternoon. As he was only 30 feet away, I was able to film him in 4K HQ, allowing me to punch in when I needed to without losing detail. I've never seen a squirrel up close this personal. They look very different this close. I also took a few shots as well. Sadly, I didn't have an ND filter then, but I was shooting from the shade into the shade, so the shots came out quite well. From now on, whenever I need stock squirrel footage, I'm covered. Now some viewers wanted me to capture insects as well. I'm sure, I, I think I know what you're thinking. With an 800 millimeter? Well, I tried. I love testing the limits of myself and the equipment. But look at this, I got this grasshopper. It must have been a sight. Me crouched down with this huge contraption trying to capture a grasshopper from about 20 feet away. But it turned out pretty good, didn't it? But for this little guy here, I think it's more of a test of the autofocus system rather than the lens, and I don't even know what species of fly this is. But one thing is certain, I should have used a faster shutter on this one. Anyhow, next time. But let's get back up into the sky. The sun set that day around 8 o'clock. Temperatures rapidly dropped into the 60s. The sky was clear, it wasn't humid, and there was a light breeze. The moon was about 90% full, and it wouldn't be full until Wednesday, but then the weather was overcast and humid, so tonight was really as good as it gets. The celestial objects were in a position well in the sky, the moon was just over the housetops, and Jupiter was just a little higher along with Saturn. Now for the moon, 800 millimeters is enough, and in 4K HQ the results are very good, but I found it easier to shoot in APS-C mode and aperture priority. It requires far less fiddling around in the settings than non-cropped. I also used a neutral picture style and shot in 8-bit. While 4K HQ provides more detail, crop mode makes it easier for the R5 to process the light and expose better, leaving less work in post. For astrophotography or even moonshots, I highly recommend the 2 times extender that would make this a better experience. Sadly, I couldn't get one in time for this review, but it's on my purchase list. Look at these shots of Jupiter and its four moons. How much better would the resolution be with a 2 times extender? Could I make out the gas bands around Jupiter, see some color, or even pick out an extra moon? How magical would that be? $899 for the Canon RF 800. It's a bargain for the fun that it delivers, even if only used a few times a year. And on sale, it's an absolute steal. But I wouldn't expect any sales until December. I did tell Patrick to call me when it's in. But the same can't be said for the 2 times extender. At $599, it feels a little bit expensive. And it's quite a bit more expensive than the EF extenders. I asked myself, if I shoot with this long enough, will it justify the cost? But I really do love the Cosmos. Capturing the shots by yourself is so much more rewarding and fulfilling than watching results of professionals caught on high-end gear. I had the telescope when I was younger, and it was not easy to learn. I had all these dials and gears, it took me a few sessions to figure it out. It got me about the same level of magnification that I'm able to get with the R5 and just the 800mm. But I could never capture the images or video, and just like then, I wanted to get closer. The magnification levels of the 2 times extenders, well, it's not cheap, so I'm waiting for a December sale. But let's get back to the stars. Just imagine tightly zoomed into the moon's surface, filling the frame uncropped and shot in 4K HQ flying across the surface like the Lunar Orbiter Mapping spacecraft in 1969, getting up and close and personal with the craters on the western side of the Moon. That's the power of astrophotography and video. 
there's nothing like capturing the shots yourself and then watching it on the big screen, looking like it was a scene right out of Apollo 13. But the real magic is getting your son and daughter involved, showing them the results through the LCD as you film. It's as much inspiring as Star Trek was on people like Elon Musk. When Canon announced the 600 and 800 millimeter lenses, I had trouble understanding the specs, largely due to my own ignorance. But having the 800 millimeter in my hands for a week, it's been absolutely eye-opening. It's kindled my wonderment and imagination as I look to the stars, moon, and planets. It's got me interested in astrophotography and video. It's rekindled my love for wildlife shooting, taking a break, freezing time, and getting lost in the moment. A perfect break from the worries of the world. And it's that removal from our busy world to the natural world, getting lost in the moment, and being childlike again, that's the true value of this lens. I know what you're thinking. Simon's about to wax on with words from Thoreau, Frost, and Wordsworth. I'm not, but I thought about it. And it's one of the side effects of this experience received from using this type of lens. But let me ask you, why are you here? Why are you watching this video? Are you looking to be inspired? Are you looking to extend your capabilities and use your camera to explore the world you live in or the cosmos above? I really understand the 800 millimeter now. It's magical. You see, it turns you from an adult into an 11 year old fascinated and wild by the animals and each new species that we discover. Seeing that spark ignited by the first glimpse of the moon up close, it's the stuff that dreams are made of. Dreams like these that inspired Elon Musk, Neil Armstrong, and Amelia Earhart. Don't you think that's magical? Let me know what you think in the comments section down below. If interested, I have links to this lens in my affiliate links. I returned the Canon RF 800mm to Patrick today back at Downtown Camera. And if you're in Canada, I highly recommend contacting Patrick if you ever need anything. He really knows his stuff. But back to that lens. Using the 800mm was a ton of fun. I couldn't wait to pick it up. I couldn't wait to use it. And now that I don't have it, I can't wait to get my own, and I will as soon as it goes on sale. The Ordinary Filmmaker is still a small channel, so every bit saved goes a long way. But I wasn't there to just return lenses that I'd borrowed. I also purchased something that will help expand my creative capabilities. I purchased a pair of Kinko ND filters. Now, I'd never owned ND filters before. Well, okay, that's not exactly true. Um, I'd always bought the UV Zero with every lens to protect it, but never a variable ND filter. When I was shooting with my APS-C camera, I never had much need for the variable filters, but with the R5, well, it collects so much more light, so I need a filter to tone it down a little bit to give me a little bit more control over the results. Some of you might remember that I suffered from an overexposure problem in some of my videos when I got the R5. Some viewers recommended ND filters, and while the issue was largely due to the exposure being locked along with the ISO shutter and f-stop, it didn't mean I didn't have an exposure problem. You see, when shooting outside, doing run and gun work, I have very few lighting options or I have very little I can do about controlling overexposure. The camera would often blink at me because I was asking it for the impossible and getting any bokeh was laughable except for at night or in low light. And shutter speed? Good luck getting 1 60th. And these are some of the issues you have with full frame. I know, cry me a river, right? Well, there are benefits to the right ND filters. You get deeper blue skies, you can get silky smooth water flow, and of course you have a lot more control over your camera settings, which gives you more creative options, and some people would say it gives you a more cinematic look. Now I had planned on buying a pair of Tiffin variable filters, but when I got there, Patrick suggested that I get, well, these, these uh, Kinko filters instead. They're only about $10, um, let's have a look. Now, one of these is empty because I've already got the lens attached. Let's see, is this the one with the lens inside it? Yes, I think. Here we go. So this is the filter here. Almost looks like a spyglass. Now this one here has an optional, um, I'm going to call it, gadget here. They've, they've got a little term for it. It's metal. And what, let, actually, let me show you a lens. I've got one right here. This is my 24 to 105. And the advantage of this is when it's on the camera, you can use this to control it. And what's really nice about this is you can also have it on this side. So it doesn't matter where your hands are. But the other big advantage of this, and this is what Patrick was telling me, while this is a very, very well constructed um, 
an e filter. It's metal, it's good quality. But when you, and you can, you can control it here by touching. Oh, you gotta be careful, I gotta do the front. You can control it on the front here. Now, what happens here is you start to do this, you inevitably get fingerprints and, well, grease and dirt on the lens. Whereas having this little gadget here, eliminates that. And I really, really do like this. And you saw when I tried to control it here, I was actually screwing it and unscrewing it. And that's where you get the problem. So you have to kind of put your fingers out in front here. Now I've only tried this for a little bit. I haven't spent a lot of time with it. So I can't really say, hey, I think these are great. You guys should go out and buy these. I'm just letting you know, this is something that I purchased for uh, my run and gun stuff for shooting outside. I'm obviously not using it on my 50 millimeter here. But I have bought one for the 50 millimeter and obviously one for the 24 to 105. So I'm going to shoot with it over the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's September weather here. There's lots going on. My son's going back to school. So that should be interesting. Catch some video there. And I'm going to let you guys know in about two or three weeks, I'm going to do a review of it. And I'm going to tell you what I think of these ND filters. Uh, but I, I know I needed them. I knew the time was coming where I needed ND filters. With the, the 70D, I looked at getting it and I thought, ah, oh, this is expensive. It's not really going to do anything for me. But once you move to a full frame, it, it's you, the, the, the low light sensitivity, because it's a full frame sensor, you've got more light being captured. You've got to deal with that light. You can't just run away from it. And uh, ND filters are the way to go. Now, variable filters, I think, are the way to go. Uh, some of the filters, you got to watch out. If you're looking at buying some, they can create um, X's or other weird artifacts on the screen. And I did look at reviews of both this and the, um, the Tiffin ones. And you'll hear reviewers of people saying there's a problem with it. And I don't know if I can show you here, but on the side here, there's max and there's min. And what happens is if you go past that range, because what happens is as you go all the way around, it goes max and then there's nothing, and then it's max, and it goes to min, and then you have a bit of a break, and it's min again. And once you cross over into those areas, that's when you can start to see some strange artifacts. So stick within the range. Don't drop it. And yeah, by the way, these things can come loose, so you want to keep an eye on it. Um, I guess it's a big enough of an issue that... Have I lost it already? Each one come. Oh, there it is. Each one comes with two of these little gadgets, so they're obviously prone to coming out. And you want them to be able to come out too, because one thing I've noticed when you put them in the camera bag, if this is on there, you're, you're, you can cause damage. So it's best to take these out when they're in transit. But I'm, I'm pretty excited by this. This is my purchase for September. I don't know if I'm buying anything else, but this is the one thing I want to purchase and help me with my outdoor activities. So I'm really excited about that. I'm making a funny face because I want to tell you about a problem I had today. It's just one of those days where I couldn't do anything right. I spent the first 20 minutes trying to get out the first couple of 30 seconds, just trying to get the intro. It took me 20 minutes. I couldn't get the intro right. It was almost like every word I said or every other word I said, or I'd get 15 seconds into it and completely screw it up. And the intro, you've got to get it right. You can't just mess around with the intro because that's what people see right away. And if you don't have the first at least 30 seconds nailed down, people are gone. So I always make sure I do that really well. And it didn't work. So I, I, I walked away. I was really angry and upset. And I cooled down. Came back about half an hour later. Well, maybe 20 minutes later. And the camera was showing that I had 25 minutes. Remember, I'm shooting in 4K 30. So it has about 30 minutes. The camera will tell you 25 and it did. So I thought, well, okay, let's give it a show again. I give it a go again. See, I did it right there, but it's almost midnight. So I'm letting that slide. Well, I should, again, another 20 minutes. This time I got a little further. I got the intro done. It wasn't the best and I got a little bit further, but I was tripping over words. I was just, and I got frustrated. So I, that was it. Turn the camera off, turn the mic off, went upstairs, took, took my laptop and started rewording things, tweaking things a little bit because I, I seem to keep tripping over the same words. And there was no reason for it. I, I had element in there and I kept saying elephant. Why was I saying elephant? Did somebody hypnotize me today and say, whenever you see the word element, you're gonna say elephant. It was stuff like that. And I cooled down for a good hour. And when I came downstairs, um, the R5 was cooled down as well. And I was able to record um, the entire video up to behind the scenes. Um, and then I recorded the first segment of behind the scenes. And unfortunately, the battery ran dead on, I thought I might just have enough and it didn't. I got to about 
couple of minutes and it went black. So I, that's why I'm recording this again. What I'm noticing with firmware 1.1 is the cool down times are a lot quicker. I do shoot in the basement. Temperatures are never above 70 degrees. And I'd say most of the time they're between 60 and 70. Let's just say 65, which is probably about 18 degrees uh, Celsius. And what I notice is if I shoot, let's say, well, this video here, I shot the entire thing up to behind the scenes. And when I saw that, well, it was flashing and um, I might only get five minutes or so left, who knows how much I would get left. I thought, well, you know what? Let's take it in the computer. I've got a lot of editing to do, and then I can come back and film behind the scenes later. And that's exactly what I did. And I had the full 25 minutes again, and it looked like this time I not only had the full 25 minutes, but I had some extra as well. I had fully cooled down. But here's what I'm noticing about firmware 1.1 is if you give it about somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes, you'll get that full 25 to 30 minutes back. You won't get the full, it's not fully cooled down. You won't get a full 40 minutes. So for example, after you finish shooting about 29 minutes and you stop it, it says you might get three minutes or something like that. You're not going to get the 10 minutes but it is so much better. Now, if you let it go around 45 minutes to an hour, uh, then it seems to fully cool down. For my work, that's not a problem, but I was talking to Stop the FOMO today, and when he, he, he's so frustrated with the R5, but he shoots 4K60. And he said, even using an external recorder, he just can't um, get the R5 to give him enough record time. And I think in that situation, you know, he's bending over backwards, trying to get it to work, but if he's having no luck and there's just not, just not enough record time there in 4K60, then obviously the R5 is not the camera for him. And if you're really serious, you you really need 4K60 and that's your basic frame rate for shooting whatever it is you're shooting, I'd really take a serious look at the, the I was going to say the Canon a7 III, but the Sony a7S III, um, the R5 is not the camera for you. If you're shooting non-overheat modes, it's great. If you're shooting 4K HQ and you don't need hours in 4k hq i find it fine um, but it, it's it, it is what it is um, 4k 60 it, if you're going to sh be shooting long videos it's definitely not the camera for you uh, 4k hq if you're looking at shooting again long videos like an hour long or so it's not the camera for you but if you're doing what i'm doing i find it to be quite good and what i've started doing is, with my weekend q a videos is i shoot them as long as I can in 4K HQ, because I'm trying to see how far I can go um, with up to about 30 minutes and then see how far I can go again before it fully shuts off. And it's an easy video to do that because for the majority of the video, I have a question, I read it off, then I answer it. So if the camera goes dead, I only lose maybe a couple of minutes at most, and it's pretty easy to go back and redo that. But you know, for anything over about 30 minutes, no, you pretty well get up to about 30 minutes and then you might get some more time, but pretty well um, that's it. But the cool down times have definitely improved. But now I'm starting to ramble, so that's it for now. I'm, I'm done with today's video. I hope you liked it. I really think the 800 millimeter is an impressive lens. It's magical. It's a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, I'd consider getting it. Um, I'm definitely going to be getting it. Uh, but that's it for now. Uh, don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win the EOS R5 if you haven't already done so. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. I very much appreciate your time. We'll see you again soon.